Thank you, Alex. Our, our final speaker tonight is uh, the Honourable Bob Carr, uh, former New South Wales Premier, former Foreign Minister. Uh, his Cabinet introduced Australia's first medically supervised injecting centre and pioneered drug courts and diversion programs in New South Wales. Bob. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Grant, and uh, I acknowledge the Gadigal people as the custodians of this land and uh, remind us that we are in an area of Sydney uh, once covered in, in uh, dry eucalypt forest where the first encounters on the east coast of Australia took place between the white settlers of 1788 and the people who'd been custodians for countless thousands of years. I remember when I was, in Dostoevsky's phrase, a raw youth, I was leader of the opposition, 1988, before anyone here was born. And I'd, I'd uh, gone on a little holiday with Helena, who was on a business trip to Chicago, and I, uh, I got the police to take me around uh, to observe their activities. And I must have had a briefing from someone uh, high in Illinois administration because I ended up coming back to Sydney and writing an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald, it was very prominent, about how we had to learn from America in how they were mobilising their constabulary to bear down on the menace of drugs. And I remember the late Ernie Page, who was the member for Waverley, later the member for Coogee, coming up to me and saying, he said, he said there's a... He was, he was telling the leader he was wrong, so he was a bit apprehensive perhaps, but I appreciated his candour. He said, there's an advisor you should talk to, Alex Wodak. He thinks you've got it all wrong. He says the, he says the American approach is entirely wrong and it's not going to work. And that was, that was the first time I heard Alex's name. But it's interesting because it confirms that way back then, Alex, as a medical professional, was engaged in talking to politicians. And that is the way forward, as Emma acknowledged, engaging with local members of parliament, getting them to see things differently, presenting them with evidence, is the way to get change in the law. I was reluctant about an experiment with a, a uh, medically supervised injecting room. Uh, there's no, I, I, I did not go into that um, summit we organised on drugs in, resp in response to revelations in January 1999, the Sun Herald, with a, what became a famous photo of a 16-year-old shooting up in a syringe-littered gutter. Um, that focused attention, it was on the eve of a state election, and I said, if we get returned as a government, we'll convene a summit on drugs. But I had no expectation that out of that would come a commitment by, by a government I led to set up a, a medically supervised injecting room on the model of those that we knew existed in Switzerland and in Hamburg, um, elsewhere in Germany as well, I think, from memory. Um, but again, what happened was that in that summit, focused on one aspect of policy, not a sprawling summit like the one Kevin Rudd was later to organise as Prime Minister, um, but focused on one aspect of policy, drugs policy. There's a lot of give and take. The ministers in my government, Jeff Shaw, Paul Whelan, Attorney General and Police Minister, John Dalabosca, who I gave responsibility for this area of policy to, and, and Craig Knowles, Health Minister, really did engage, really did engage with everyone who had a view on this matter. And that engagement met, meant that one evening in the, in the ante room to the Legislative Council chamber up in Macquarie Street, um, Knowles and Della were there saying to me, um, we, we now see merit in the conce concept of a medically supervised injecting room for heroin. And I was very reluctant. I felt, I felt queasy at the prospect. I had a visceral dislike of heroin. I had no notion that this was where I was going to be drawn. I, I, um, I wrote in my diary something about this because we ended up embracing it. I made some tweaks in the proposal. And um, I said in my diary, and I quote 
my diary, as Lincoln said, Abraham Lincoln that is, he didn't control events, events controlled him. Events drove me to announce yesterday that there would be a medically supervised injecting room at King's Cross, run by the Sisters of Charity in St Vincent's Hospital, an outcome I'd previously opposed. The drug summit made it impossible to resist. I sold it in the media, probably more convincingly because of my own reservations. Politics often presents a choice between the unpalatable and the disastrous. I said on ABC Radio this morning, better to try to shift the self-injection off the streets. That was a you know, great advantage of keeping a diary is that I would have forgotten all of that. But this brings back to me the queasiness I felt at being dragged by events to do something I'd previously opposed because of a distaste uh, for heroin. My brother had died of a heroin overdose. I, um, I think there are some lessons out of this. I don't want to make too much of what we did. It's a, a pretty meagre landscape if we keep returning to this, 20 years old, as a working example of drug law reform in Australia. Um, but it did stand until Victoria opened one in North Richmond. It did stand for almost 20 years as the only example of, of something um, as, as challenging. But it was specific, it was a specific proposal, as Alex hinted in his excellent address a minute ago. Uh, we weren't proposing, and it's wrong to do this in politics, weren't proposing a wide, open-ended reform. Was, we closed in on a very speci specific notion. That is, in one location in Sydney only, it's better to have people going into premises run by the state than shooting up in laneways and in car parks. And I found in this that sometimes your most powerful argument with the public is a tangential one. If, if forced by the media to justify what we were doing by, by commentators who weren't accepting the logic of harm minimization, I resorted to this argument. Think of the paramedics. Should they be forced to go into a a car park or a laneway dark at night with the danger to them of needle prick injury, of infection. No, this is about an occupational health and safety issue for paramedics on whom we depend. So that's a good, that, that, that was a very useful auxiliary argument because people opposing what we were doing did, have, did not have a comeback to that and pick the best people to implement it. We, we chose Ingrid Van Beek, director of the Kirkenden Road Centre, after the Vatican had intervened, probably at, probably at the request of a local conservative cleric, to take the Sisters of Charity out of this. And we couldn't have had better people managing this and doing so, and, and the, the figures this is the other thing, to quickly produce figures that show the things a success. And it wasn't long before we were able to demonstrate that people who would have overdosed in laneways or car parks or the corner of a, a public open space somewhere in King's Cross were being rescued uh, and the number of deaths averted was very real. That's the way I think to manage reform but one other thing is to answer every criticism. And in my little memoir, Run For Your Life, which I know you've all read, <laughs> all proceeds went to the, the kids who were victims of the, Syri the Syrian civil war. But in that, I actually quote, I actually reproduce a letter that I, got, I, I sent to Alan Jones and John Della Bosca sent to the Sunday Telegraph after they'd criticised somehow. They got something wrong. Alan Jones said that... Um, we're, in government, we're talking about a safe injecting room. I pointed out to him, nobody in the government uses the word safe when describing the injecting room or the practice of using heroin. The only term ever used is medically supervised injecting room. Um, and I, I pointed out to him, addicts will not be supplied with heroin or any other drug by the injecting room operators. That's all, two points. But Bill Clinton once said, you reply to everything, every criticism, you reply to it to set the record straight. Uh, Della Bosca, to, to 
the Sunday Telegraph quoting Piers Ackerman, contrary to Mr Ackerman's assertion, drug users around the state will not be able to claim free passage by telling police they're on their way to the injecting room. So you're applying to everything. There's some of the lessons out of this reform. Um, Victoria took some time to get around to doing it, but North Richmond had the same problems of degradation of local life, a residential area more than a commercial one compared with King's Cross. Um, and it just made sense. It just made sense. But it was interesting that uh, in Victoria, which is seen as a, a very progressive state, it still took a long time to, for the government to get there, even though the Labor government in Victoria had been elected with a specific promise, I think, to open five. I, I addressed, some years ago, I addressed a gathering, I'd say, double the size of this one, people who work in the insurance industry. I was talking about making state government policy, and I said, I want to take a poll. I outlined the, the argument about music festivals, music events, and the possibility that their youngsters going to such events might be able to, to get a drug, an illegal drug, tested on site. I said, would you accept that, unsatisfactory as it is in many ways, as a lesser harm than your son or daughter running the risk of imbibing something that's impure and might kill them? I said, think through the arguments. It is a big ask, but would you be prepared to go along with that? I'm going to ask you now, I gave them time to think about it. I said, ask you to put up, I asked them to put up their hand uh, if they favoured proceeding with such a trial. The overwhelming majority, I thought these would be conservative folk, put up their, their hand in favour of such a trial. I guess they had sons and daughters and they thought that was the lesser of two evils. Again, as I conceded in my diary, a lot of public policy is a choice between the unpalatable, something that's distasteful, and something that's disastrous. A young life lost because there wasn't a way of testing the illegal substance that she or he had picked up. So I think, given that experience and given the record in this state with the medically supervised in injecting room, I'd be encouraging um, the Premier to take up the implement, implementations he's got. He, he didn't have a summit, but he had a, an inquiry headed by a judicial figure, and the report has been out for 28 months. Um, there might have been some media attention, but I haven't noticed there's opposition mobilised and agitated about its harm minimisation suggestions. And as Alex says on the on the website for the Australian Drug Law, Law, Law Reform Association, one, treated as the principles are, can we treat it as a health and social problem, not as a law enforcement problem? First test. Second test, is it feasible to reduce penalties for personal use? These are principles we've applied uh, with other drugs in New South Wales. And three, can we contemplate the removal of penalties down the track. So they're the principles to bring to this debate. I would, I don't think there's anything in the zeitgeist that should inhibit the Premier from taking the public into his confidence and saying, these are reforms, they've been recommended. It's in the spirit of harm minimisation. That, that, that thing introduced 20 years ago by the Carr government has worked, it saved lives. The principles are the same here. Now the challenge is a drug called ICE. If it doesn't work, we won't proceed with the experiment. We'll revisit the law. But take me into your confidence, and you could say, you could say, as I said in 1999, my instincts on this are conservative. He's even more persuasive in saying that than I was, given his reputation. Um, but I've looked at the facts, listened to experts, wide range of experts, and I think this is a route we can take. Just a final thought, uh, and, and it's important to proceed with drug law reform in bite-sized uh, chunks. We're not going to have uh, the overnight introduction of uh, the reforms that we've seen in Portugal. Uh, we're proceeding 
uh, at, a, at a certain pace. But it has been pretty slow, and I'd encourage political leaders to think that taking people into their confidence, saying it is an experiment, we can always reconsider it, but it is about harm minimisation, and in the end, the chances of a young person's life being blotted out, um, that, that chance is, is reduced by the cautious reformist approach we're taking. Just a final thought, you think of what I saw in America when I visited Chicago as opposition leader all those years ago in 1988, um, that, that the, the, the illegal status of all drugs, no interest in harm minimization, it's all law enforcement. What effect has that had geostrategically? It has been enormously harmful to Latin America. You have Mexico today, a state deformed by corruption, kleptocracy, um, drug cartels in charge of the country making and unmaking governments. It's a crippled nation. It should have been on a trajectory to first world living standards because of its proximity to US markets and because of the, the smartness of its people. It's the American demand for illegal drugs that has wrecked Mexico's future, the genius, the, the, the people of Mexico. And so it is for those, the, 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 the countries in, the, in Central America. Um, I read a novel about set in Colombia and it, it told the story of Americans going there as Peace Corps workers. Peace Corps workers delivering aid to the impoverished peasant population of this country and then choosing, this is back in the 60s, choosing to introduce marijuana as a crop that could be exported to um, youthful buyers in the United States, enriching the peasantry of Colombia and meeting a demand that these Peace Corps workers thought is altogether innocent. If you think about it, our great ally America is the most disruptive force in the world. You've got that whole region, Central America, and, and that great Republic of Mexico operating with the distortion, the corruption, the cartelization created by one thing, American demand for illegal drugs and America's resistance up until now to any thought of European style drug law reform. Just a thought, thank you. Drug Policy Australia is a fully tax deductible charity. If you'd like to help save our young people from the harms of prohibition, please visit the donation page on our website. Thank you.